And I want to start this morning with a story from Erwin McManus. Erwin wrote a book called The Barbarian Revolt, and he entitles this episode, true story, Jump School. He says, for several years, we rented a two-story house in Los Angeles, and both my kids spent a good portion of their childhood enjoying that home. A unique feature of the house was a small window in the upstairs bathroom that led to a path to the roof. He said, I always figured there'd be a day when one of my kids would climb up on that sink and figure a way to get out on the ledge. He said, it just seemed like something me and my brother Alex would have done when we were kids. Well, early one evening, Kim and I are in the front yard when all of a sudden we hear a little voice calling from the roof. And as soon as Kim saw him, her nurturing instinct kicked in, and she started commanding him to get back inside. I have to admit, I was kind of proud of him right then. But what he did next totally surprised me. Looking past his mom, he asked me if he could jump. When Aaron shouted, Dad, can I jump? Kim answered on my behalf. No, you can't jump. Go back inside. As if he hadn't heard anything at all. He looked right past his mom. Ask me again, Dad, can I jump? Now I know what I'm supposed to do. A dad is never supposed to override the mom. I'm working on that. I'm just telling you what really happened. (laughs) After all, he did ask me. And I said, yeah, go ahead. (laughs) He said, really? I said, yeah, sure. Go ahead and jump. And Kim looked at me like I was out of my mind. Asked, what do you think you're doing? And in sort of an explanation to her, I asked Aaron, Aaron, are are you going to jump sometime? She said, yeah, I think so. Okay, I'd rather have you jump now, so if you break your legs, we have time to take you to the hospital. That made perfect sense to me. He responds, Dad, do you think I'll make it? I said, oh yeah, you'll make it. If I knew one thing for certain, he would make it to the ground. (laughs) I just didn't know what condition. He said, okay, I'm going to jump. He said, I have one suggestion before you take off, buddy. Try to clear the concrete. The grass is softer. (laughs) He thought that was a good idea. Stepped back as far as he could. And on his last step said, Dad, catch me. I almost caught him. It was so close. He just slipped right through my hands. I think I did slow his fall a little bit. In either case, he has recovered well since then. He's, I'm just kidding. He was fine. Don't try this at home. And then he writes this. He goes, I know it's very unlikely that you will ever invite me to speak at a parenting conference. <laughs> but hang on with me for a moment. He said, from the parenting end, I have seen far too many kids raised in Christian homes who are indifferent to Christ and often carry a great disdain for the church. He said, and sometimes it's a result of blatant hypocrisy. But other times, it's nothing less than sheer monotony and boredom. We raise our children in a cocoon of domesticated faith and wonder why they run as far as they can to find adventure. He said, a long time ago, I decided that would never happen to my children. He said, I am a first-generation Christian. But over the years, I've seen the dangers that comes with being the children of the second and further generations. First-generation believers, even when they themselves are barbarians, often make the mistake of raising their children to be civilized. He said, I wrote that and I thought for a moment, but I want my boys to be civilized. And then I read the newspaper. I thought, well, not by this civilization, I don't. Not some of those aspects of culture. I want my sons to be counter-cultural. And I believe that's where we all are. That's where we've been this whole month and beyond. Where We, we want to raise G-rated kids in an R-rated world. That is counter-cultural, yes. But it doesn't have to be boring. In fact, it can't be boring. And when Jeff's done an excellent job this month of illustrating each week, you've seen the, the appeal, the intrigue, the adventure. But the monsters are always offering curiosity. So we're going to finish this morning saying we want to raise faithful kids in a faithless society. Put your own jump school together if you can. I found this picture. It's kind of an old-time example. I don't really know what's happening here, but (laughs) there's a baby strapped to the front of the car, and he's enjoying the ride or the heat, or I don't know what that is. But uh, show, show your kids that standing for Christ in a world that wants to do anything but is the most exciting adventure that there is. 
So we start with the call to arms. We want to understand why all this is important, why this needs to be first priority. I hope if you've been here for the last several weeks, I don't have to make a, a lot of illustration. hope we've covered the point. You know, the world out there is competing. Okay? And, and maybe for those who are new, um, we'll give you... These are the words of Professor Alexander Tyler in his central work, The Cycle of Democracy. And he wrote this in 1778. So the average age of the world's greatest civilizations has been 200 years, and they have all passed through this sequence, from bondage to spiritual faith. From spiritual faith to great courage. From courage to liberty. From liberty to abundance. From abundance to complacency. From complacency to apathy. From apathy to dependence. And from dependence back to bondage. Honestly, where are we on that circle? Apathy at best. Dependence too often. Professor and preacher Mark Moore writes this, The disintegration of the family continues to be our culture's greatest challenge. The only hope for our culture is the family, and the only hope for the family is the spiritual leadership of parents committed to biblical principles. How many times have we quoted Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And this reminder, the primary role for parents is not to train their child to be an athlete, scholar, or musician. The primary role for parents is to pass their faith to their children. Rebecca Hagelin has been writing in Home Invasion. She said, it is the right duty and privilege of parents to impart their values on their children. It's a privilege to impart our own values on our kids. There's no more exciting adventure. And I got our ropes back out. If you remember for a few weeks back, these four ropes represent your week. 168 hours represented by 168 feet of rope. And we said the blue rope was about 60 hours when they're supposed to be sleeping and resting. And the green one is about 38 feet of school and activities. And we cautioned that the yellow one was church. It's only five feet long for the five hours in church. But 65 remains in this red one. This is the time when they're under your care, and we need to celebrate. Parents, you have the most rope. You have the most influence. I never intended this series to be depressing. Let's be realistic. There's a lot of monsters out there, but God Almighty in here, and he's out there, and he's everywhere, and I can win this. I can challenge my kids. I can inspire the kids, not just to jump off the roof, but to be bold for the kingdom. Maybe go through your family. Go through... What, what are the favorite Bible stories from the family? What, what do we remember? <clears throat> what, what makes a great Bible story great? I say Daniel, and somebody's going to say, in the lion's den. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those three guys in the furnace and the fire. You know, Noah, the flood, the ark. You know, Esther going into the king's presence, risking her life to save a nation. Rahab's hiding the spies. Joshua's marching around the walls. You know, the whole plagues in the nation and Pharaoh and the Red Sea. It, it's exciting. How many times when our teams come back, they come back from Spain, uh, Navajo Nation, Haiti. What do they tell you? They don't stand here and tell you, oh, it's all ease and comfort. No. Some of it's challenging. Some of it's concerning. But that's what makes it memorable every time. And I have yet to find an individual who's gone who doesn't want to go back. I saw one of the girls from our team this week posted something online. She had no idea that I was going to reference that. And even this week, she said, missing those people and those opportunities. This is not daunting. It's conquerable, our greatest adventures, our fondest memories, making faith an aspect of any trip every week. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, yeah, we want to do that. Here's some, I don't know if you want to say tools, you might say weapons, uh, soldiers on the front lines. Here, here's the part of the sermon where we're trying to equip the parents. You know, and, and the first effort that we'll put in this list, whether a tool or weapon, is 
please have a united front. And I put some little cartoons on here just because I thought they were funny. I know only the people in the front row can read them. You've got to be united. This is a dad who's using his baby as exercise equipment. The baby has a kettlebell. baby has a medicine ball. Here's how you use your baby. I'm figuring some moms may say no. You know, you're not going to use my child as exercise equipment. You've you got to be able to be together. Rebecca Hagelin wrote this way. She said, long ago, my husband Andy and I took the time to get it all out in the open and come to a common understanding of how we would proceed in protecting our family. She says, I urge you to do the same and start today. And for some of us, that's where it starts. She said, after examining my own source of faith and my husband and I recommitting to each other through a loving, selfless relationship where we face the world as a team, I discovered I had the proper framework in which to proceed. Suddenly the issue of fighting the culture and the many daily battles and the daily questions didn't seem quite so hard anymore. Because now the terms have been set, the guidelines have been determined, the roadmap has been laid out, all I have to do is stay the course. And she wrote a note for single parents. She said, I understand your challenge is harder, but you can do it also one day at a time. Recommit yourself to the cause every morning. We have to be united in this effort. Here's another tool or opportunity. Just daily, daily immersion. Make, I just thought that was, that's a cross between a, it's a combination baby chair and teething ring at the same time. So just everyday things, making faith a part of everyday life. Don't, don't just save this stuff up for a vacation or a, a mission trip. No. This is for September 26, 27, 28. We have challenged repeatedly Deuteronomy 6. Four and following. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up every day. Daily things. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. And the Israelites did that. They continue to do that picture of their the, the phylacteries, the little boxes that they have and still use on his forehead, one on his bicep, the scriptures that they bind there. We have these bracelets and we stamp the text and the verse right on those. And bracelets, this is kind of a, a side on bracelets. What do you have on your wrist? And what is it constantly putting in your mind? I had one mom say, she said, I was encouraged actually to take my cancer reminder bracelet off. Because it's every time I look at it, what I think. Disease, despair, discouragement. Also, everyday little reminders. I, I have seen very few naked refrigerators in my day. This is not one of ours. Don't judge anybody. It's just a stock picture. You know, most people have something on the refrigerator. What is there that reminds us of faith and God and adventure? Could be in the car or the van, hanging from the mirror, in the CD player, the DVD player. What reminds us of text, of scripture, where you work out? Probably usually there's some kind of motivational something from the Bible. Could be everyday things like having conversations with your kids. And I know you can't read that fine print. If you are what you'd eat... I'd rather be thin, like a french fry, than round, like a head of lettuce. (laughs) What conversations do we have with our kids? To encourage your children to make faith in Jesus their own, talk with them about what you are learning from God. And the stories of how he has been faithful to you. You share your favorite scripture with your kids and tell them why. Use your Bible to problem solve daily events and efforts. And if your kids are sports minded, if you have not listened to a Clemson coach, I think Dabo Swinney at the press conference he had a couple weeks ago, you look that up online and, and you gotta find all the fine print. It's now referred to as his sermon. Swinney's sermon. <clears throat> but he addresses the, the situation. So everything's covered. And he will suggest that the root of the problem in our country is fill in the blank. And how you can solve it. I'll let you look it up. Problem solve that. I'll give you a clue. Um, His root has three letters in the word. And it starts with S. And his solution has five letters. 
and starts with J. So you might want to look that up and talk about what's, what's the coach saying. Everyday faith. Little things, big things, great things, tough things. The, the difficult days. You know, if, if you want your kids to be faithful in the midst, you know, then you have to be faithful, even in the tough times. You know? And Rebecca Hagelin was writing, and she was writing of the period from September 2001 to 2002. That, she said that 12 months. She goes, that, that was horrendous for me. Tough times. That one says, whoever wrote the phrase, easy like Sunday morning, obviously never had to get a child ready for church. <laughs> and you might think that's tough. And this is the year that she had. Because it was 01, September 01. She said, naturally, first, the nation is struck by the tragedy of, of the terrorist attack. And then she said, my personal world began shaking from a series of deaths. First, with my beloved grandmother. At the same time, my mom is dying of painful, lingering bone cancer. In the midst of my mother's suffering, the love of her life and her primary caregiver, my wonderful daddy, dropped over dead of a heart attack. Three weeks later, one of my best friends died. I had three emergency room visits with my kids over the span of five weeks. My mom passed away a month later. A previous back injury of mine was re-aggravated with the physical care that I gave my mom in her last hours, which ruptured two of my lower discs and landed me in a tremendous pain and in bed. Unlike any other time in my life, I was struck by the brevity and the fragility of life and found myself reflecting and quiet and waiting for God to change my world. Talk about adventure. I didn't always say it would be fun out on vacation. She said, I don't think it was an accident that during the most difficult period of my life, I met Shirley Dobson and heard about her book, Certain Peace in Uncertain Times. Was that a horrendous string of 12 months? Yes, but I guarantee you her kids were watching to see how she employed her faith in the tough times just as much as what she preached in the fun times. Maybe one of the simple everyday things that, that we might overlook is the fact that we have the opportunity to prepare, prepare their hearts, give them information. She says, you're not a victim of identity theft, you're a twin. <laughs> How am I preparing my kids for what they need to know? You pre- if you plant a garden, what do you do? The first thing you do is till the soil. Prepare. You're going to paint a room. You might put tape. You put down drop cloths. Take out the furniture. You prepare going on vacation. Check the tires. Check the fluids. Service a vehicle. Prep work. Preparation always matters. And I understand it is the Holy Spirit's work to convict hearts and minds of their need. That is from John 16.5. But we pray for our families. We pray for our kids to have soft hearts, moldable lives, a blessing. Do I bless my kids? Gary Smalley, John Trent, they wrote The Blessing. See, if you've ever read through the Old Testament, you see all these Old Testament guys. These old guys are always blessing their kids. You read in your daily, what's this Old Testament blessing? Jacob and Esau are fighting, or I, I want the blessing. It's an important thing. And I know I'm, I'm usually on the side of discipline your kids, correct your kids, be hard on your kids, don't make it easy for them, they're too subtle. On the other side, am I blessing? They said, if you follow the Old Testament pattern, the patriarchs, they lay out a blessing for your child, daily basis. They said, bless your child with loving, consistent, meaningful touch. Bless your children with spoken words that are positive and encouraging. Bless your child by reminding them they have high value. Bless your child by picturing for them a special future. Bless your child with an active commitment to them as a person. And they're writing that about blessings, and Peter Buckland followed up the same thing. He said, parents are primary. He said, here's our example, the blessing prayer. This prayer expresses a parent's unconditional love for the child and is spoken over the child every day. He said, my wife and I use the following blessing. This is kind of a template or a pattern. Lord, please bless Audrey to always love and obey you to grow up to be a wise woman, to enjoy reading the Bible and learn of its truth, to serve you all of her life, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Please help Audrey to be a woman of compassion. And then in parentheses, he goes, one character trait that needed to be developed. <laughs> regardless, he said, regardless of where you live or your proximity to your kids, you can write, say, 
text a blessing. The power of prayer. Just everyday prayers. We have, if you come to our house, there's still a little token that just floats around the table. Whoever has the token, it's your turn to pray. We're not going to call somebody out. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to let you slide. If you come to our house and you sit in the seat where the token is, it's your turn to pray. You know, it's that simple. It's a part of what we do. Kid comes home. If you ever do get a recounting of them, usually we say they don't tell me anything. But if they're telling you, sometimes as soon as they start talking, then you want to jump in and intercede. And, what? Hold on that. Let them talk. Make a note. Now this that you mentioned, that'd be a good thing. Let's pray about that. Here's an opportunity for us to pray together about X, Y. <clears throat> Power of prayer. And all, I've been quoting all month from Rebecca Hagelin. She has all this faith. Where'd she learn it? She's going to tell you her parents. And this is, a, this is a story of adventure that actually happens in, I think, one of the most unlikely scenarios. And Because and I'm as guilty, especially as, as dad, I'm as guilty as, oh, adventure, fun, go out, death-defying, you know, this is what we're going to remember. And this happens nowhere near any of that. It's a great impact on her life. The small child froze in her footsteps and slightly cocked her head to listen more carefully. What was that sound? In the stillness of the hallway near the family bedrooms, she heard it again. It sounded like a low, mournful cry, a soulful weeping. And knowing that her daddy was the only other person at home, she tiptoed quietly and silently toward his room. Filled with concern and curiosity. As she drew closer, the little girl could see that the door was slightly ajar and she pushed it open just enough to peek inside. So that a sense of holiness permeated the air. And in an instant, her impressionable young mind and spirit were impacted so deeply that she would embrace the memory of that moment countless times throughout her life. She said, I was that little girl. And what I experienced that day some 30 years ago would forever define my father and guide my faith. In the solace of his room, I saw my daddy kneeling beside his bed, weeping and praying from the depths of his soul for one of his young patients. As the sobs and tears flowed freely from this great man, I lingered for a moment in breathless awe as I felt my own faith in God soar beyond my own understanding. Here was my Papa Doc, as he was affectionately known, a Johns Hopkins educated pediatrician, the epitome of the brilliant loving physician portrayed in Norman Rockwell paintings. His commitment to his young patients was so encompassing. At the end of the long day of work, you'd often find him poring over medical journals, trying to stay on the cutting edge much more than a practitioner and student of medicine, my dad was a man of God. And on that day, so many years ago, as I peeked into his room to discover the source of this mystical sound, it became clear to me that my daddy relied on the awesome power and wisdom of the great physician to guide him. That is one of her greatest adventures. And I don't know that he ever even knew they took it together. These everyday opportunities to impact our kids. And, and the last one that I put on the, that list was, I just want to strive to make home, just make home fun. Just make it faithful. <laughs> Thought I'd be funny and catch my granddad sleeping on vacation till I made the same mistake. <laughs> Grandpa caught him and started in making fun of him. You know, <clears throat> I'm not saying, again, that every kid has to jump off the roof. But what will be your kid's favorite stories? What part of you will they most emulate? Children are natural mimics who act like their parents despite every effort to teach them good manners. <laughs> and these stories always start out as something. They start out as fishing stories or farming stories or football stories. But they become stories of faith. What will my family fondly remember? I, I just I quiz my wife the other day. I say, how come every time she makes a big bowl of popcorn, there's always an apple? I Where'd you get? She said, well, that's just what we do. She just remembers that's a part of what they always did. And I thought back. Why well, I still love to go out and throw a ball. Because I can very fondly remember the day my dad let me tear a hole in our pretty green grass in the backyard. I made a batter's box with a wooden frame. And we stood there for days on end for years. I remember playing ball with those guys. We were watching, we noticed that both our boys, as soon as they moved out, one of the first things they did was get a pizza pan and put it in the up because that's what you do. 
on Sunday night. You have pizza, that's just part of the tradition. Super simple thing. But that's where hopefully fun and faith grow together. I know we're at the end, but you should be able to expect a few supplies from the reinforcements, from from the rest of us, the church. Um, Brian Jennings is equipping parents to lead their families. Parents, don't make this journey alone. The expectation is that the family of God will join in the religious education of the children. In order for children to know God, to trust God, to know the law, to keep the commandments, to remain faithful, to tell the next generation of the power and the faithfulness of the Lord, they need a community of faith. Psalm 78, 4, we will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation of the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders he has done. You need us, we need you, and we all need these kids. And I have spoken this week to two ladies. They didn't know anything about this sermon. They both said, our church is fading. We will not last. There are no kids. Teresa Welch said, what does God say about children? When you see a child, what's the first thing that comes to mind? (laughs) Probably depends on what the kid is doing at the moment. (laughs) Children are unpredictable. A quiet, thoughtful child can become almost instantly a holy terror. But each child, regardless of position, carries the image of God. He says, our perception of kids is usually limited by their immature and inconsistent behaviors. There is a beauty in the simplicity in the way that kids interact with the world. Children remind us of what it means to love unconditionally, forgive freely, and hope beyond reason. Children teach us about honesty and joy. They demonstrate for us the struggles of patience and self-control. She said, I wonder if it's in our best moments of childhood more than any other point in life when we come closest to reflecting God's perfect image. We need us. We need all of us of every age. We're going to continue to try to provide resources. Sharon did a great job of pulling out on a little table out there by the library. Hands-on, specific parenting family resources. They don't even all fit on the table. She tips some over. There's a family shelf in the library, and if a book's laying this way, it might be especially useful for parenting and family. I believe we can provide competent parental couples mentors. If you would like to have a mentor or you would be willing, let us know. We can hook those up. We've talked about this ministry fair. Visit that with a mindset of our family. I went down through the whole list and I pulled out some. I thought this could be family friendly. Um, One of them is preparing communion. Your family can do that. And I laugh. It wasn't too long ago. One time I saw a young man, and he's walking in with the bread on Sunday morning. I said, good morning, communion baker. He didn't say anything, but mom playfully corrected. He is not any communion baker. He is the communion carrier. Okay, That's the extent. I said, okay, I understand. Another opportunity next time. Home communion. You can go. I've told many times. I'll never forget that all the times I went with my dad. He spilled his coffee on my lap. I went out. It was cold. My pants were smoking. You know, I, still, I remember that. I remember going with my dad to take home communion to people who were shut in. We would always read 1 John 4, 7 and following. Had me read it every time. Mission trips, family adventure. Ask Mark what it's like to drive in Grand Guave. You'll have adventure. You know, the, the bulletins, welcome, hospitality, greeting. We always appreciate when young people are holding the door. What if you had a whole family? Standing there together. You can play ball this afternoon. We have an opportunity to play softball. How many chances do you really get where the whole family can compete together in the same game at the same time? There is a food pantry ministry that you can supply, and sometimes it's such an encouragement to take your kids and let them realize what even in our community people struggle with. Landscaping and maintenance. If you don't think there's any adventure with kids and power tools, then go to Heartbeats. Take your kids down there. I don't care however unruly you think your kids are. What an idea and encouragement to those moms who are anticipating and may be afraid. We do this thing online where it says take them a meal. And you can take the whole family. How many times have the older folks, the recipients of the meals or the visits, they care less about the food and they're more excited by the smile of the little kid? In a prayer ministry, 
I hope you're not only praying with your kids now, but you write down whether what they're praying as a child or especially your prayers for them and how God has answered those. And years from now, you open up that book and say, God's always been able. There's a horse clinic on there. That might be a little baby step outside your comfort zone. I understand horses are powerful animals. We do everything we can to minimize the risk, but there's going to be a risk. Life has risk. Will it be paired with faith? Uh, maybe you can add some other adventures. You take charge. You take the lead. You serve the Lord. You make it fun for your family. Just enjoy the journey. <clears throat> and we're going to close. And typically I pray. Today I'm going to invite you to pray. You pray where you are. to get some, some have the privilege right now to be in a circle with your family. Stephen, I actually see your family coming in right now. So you can we pray together. You pray with your family, pray quietly, pray reverently. Um, if your kids are downstairs, you pray for them. If your kids are 100 miles away, you pray for them. You pray for these families. You pray, but I'm just going to give you, just huddle up right there. I don't care if somebody moves around, but you pray together with your family for a few moments, or you pray for these families who are represented, and then I'll close. So just take a moment to pray together where you are. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for opportunities to be together as your family, to understand the way that you provide and challenge us each day to mature our faith individually. May we be able to continue in that vein, pass that on to our children, our grandchildren, our siblings, others beyond. We pray that we would be mindful of opportunities that come our way each and every day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We continue to encourage you to consider your decision, maybe the, the bold step that you need to take. Uh, let's stand together and we'll sing this hymn of invitation to 481. Come just that.
o'clock, Alexandria to the life, turn right on North Liberty, go out past the pizza place, up by the water tower there on the hill, it's just right out there, first right. We'll start about 2 o'clock and we'll keep some ice cream. If you have anything you want to bring to the field, we'll truck it down to our house and keep it cold until 3.30 or so, and then we'll bring it back up there this afternoon. And tonight, young people, middle school and younger, 6 o'clock, if you want to audition for the musical for Christmas, there's a sign up out here on the table. And there are also in the, on the table center, please take one of these. There's a hundred of these. There's plenty of these. Pray 31, you have an insert in your bulletin. They will take us through the nation. It's geared for the month of October. It doesn't say like October 1st, 2nd, but each day, it'll, they'll just take two states. Day 15, pray for the leaders, churches, and Christians in Nebraska and Nevada. Pray for, the, pray for those who serve as police officers, prosecutors, defenders, etc. There's a quote from Spurgeon. Here's a reference from Acts 4, 31. Just each day, they'll take us through. By the end of October, we will have prayed our way across the country for all the leaders, for all the situations. So please take one of those and keep it with you for October, which does start this Saturday. Anything different high school, middle school? Uh, for tonight, no. Uh, the only thing that I have, um, I will have a sign-up sheet for the, uh, the high schoolers, if you guys want to go to Kings Island on October 29th, it is a Saturday. I'll have a sign-up sheet for that. Please sign up so I have numbers of who all is going. And if you're bringing friends, put your friend's name on there. Um, so, yeah, just a reminder for that. All right. You pray? Yep. Father, again, we come to you, and we just want to praise you and just recognize who you are, Father. Um, we recognize that, like we said earlier, that you are the Lord of the harvest. And as we come into this time of you know, watching the leaves turn and watching the, the fields ripen for harvest, you know, we can only be reminded of you know, that this world is, is coming to an end and that the harvest is ready and that the workers are few. Father, I ask right now that you lift people up, you encourage them, and you send your spirit into people to help them understand that they are the harvesters. They are the ones, the ones out in the field, the ones that are working, that are working for you. And Father, we praise you so much, and we thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of your story, to be a part of this whole, this whole story that you are laying out in front of us, that we get to be a part of this. I thank you so much for that, that you loved us enough to include us. Father, again, we just thank you for this time that we can spend together as brothers and sisters, <coughs> as family, and learn a little more about you. We love you, and it's all this that we ask and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's close this morning by singing, His strength is perfect. <coughs>